In our last episode, we had discussed the course of the American abolitionist and suffragist movement until the Civil War. There we learned how the black people and women used the rhetoric of the Declaration of Independence to claim suffrage and civil rights for themselves. We also learned how the women began to form societies and associations to expedite reforms and how women writers began complementing the role played by the women in the social reform movements. And finally, we had a discussion on how women created their own space for discussing women's rights so that they could participate in public life as free citizens. But when the Civil War began, the issue of slavery dominated American politics for several years and the issue of women's rights went into the back burner. In this episode, we propose to continue our discussion on the limitations of American democratic system. Black people and women of post-Civil War era. After the Civil War, the most important thing that happened was the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which was ratified and came into effect in 1870. What the 15th Amendment did was to give the vote to the black man. Now, the alliance between the abolitionists and women's rights movements had been on the expectation that when political change happened, it would happen for everybody that blacks, men and women, and white women would all get the same rights as white men. But in fact, this did not happen. The 15th Amendment gave rights only to black men. So the white women who had been such an important part of the struggle felt betrayed. Uh. Ma'am, here I want to ask that this rift between the men and the women in case of the rights, what was the reaction or the response of the black woman in this context? Yes, indeed. Very good question because they were both women and black. Um, and they too remained disenfranchised by the 15th Amendment. What black women understood was that they could not, at the end of the day, make common cause with white women because the division of race and the hierarchy of race was just too stark and too important for black women to say that we will make common cause with white women against black men. So when white women responded extremely negatively to the black man getting the vote, black women could not participate in that rhetoric in the same way. They felt that black men's getting the vote was a step forward and there, would, there was hope that one day black women would follow in that footstep. Uh, at the same time, of course, black women were an important part of the abolitionist struggle and they were also unhappy, they also felt betrayed by the fact that they had not been considered in enfranchisement. With their hopes dashed and with a sour taste of betrayal in their mouth, women realized that they needed some other strategies to win their case. And what they did was to come together. In 1868, the ratification of the 14th Amendment proved, as I said, an affront to uh, this uh, group. And this, this was further reinforced in 1870 when the 15th Amendment came in. In response to these various uh, developments, uh, Elizabeth Stanton and Susan Anthony came together and they formed what is the more radical uh, group, the National Woman Suffrage Association, NWSA. At around the same time, another group of women's activists, Lucy Stone, Julia Ward Howe, Henry Blackwell, they organized another group which was more conservative. 
which was called the American Women Suffrage Association, the OSA. This was established first in Boston. They worked for a time against each other until Stanton and Antony really uh, effected a rapprochement between the two groups and they realized they would have to work together because um, uh, there was no, absolutely no positive response to the question of women's vote in the political establishment of the time. So by 1890, the two groups merged together and became the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the NOSA, which was to dominate the entire battle, the struggle for uh, women's suffrage in the United States. Susan B. Anthony in this period, for instance, was arrested repeatedly, uh, the, once for attempting to vote, to go and actually, the, the women did not have the right to vote, uh, so to register her protest, she actually went to try and vote. In 1872, in the presidential elections, she tried to vote for Ulysses Grant. Six years later, in 1878, a women's suffrage amendment was introduced to the U.S. Congress. Uh, a number of other groups began to be floated, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, the National Council of Jewish Women, NCJW, the National Association of Colored Women, which was the Black uh, Women's Association. It is a, with the alliance of all these associations, so you have ethnic identities, class identities, race identities, all of which are interconnecting with the question of women's rights. And the movement is gaining momentum through 1890s and the early 1900s. Uh, and it is with these that increasingly pressure is borne uh, upon the federal government. In 1900, uh, the regular national headquarters of NOSA was established in New York City and a new president replaced Susan Anthony, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt. It is in the early 1910s that the NOSA grew from an organization of uh, hardcore, if you like, women's rights activists to a much wider, broader association that drew into its folds uh, ordinary women of many colors and hues. Uh, this organization's strength can be gauged from the fact that it obtained a hearing from the Congress, every Congress, between 1869 and 1990. <music> In addition to this strategy to gain suffrage through constitutional amendments, reformers also pursued a policy of approaching state legislatures to pass laws giving women voting rights in various states. This was partly uh, forced upon women activists because they realized that this policy of chasing the federal government wasn't working that federal government was remarkably unsympathetic to their demands. So this was a second line strategy, if you like, which became, uh, which was pursued very, very seriously. Um, it began quite early, it began from the 18th century, uh, but was really pursued more vigorously from the mid to late 19th century and more in the early 20th century. In part, they were responding to the new rights to vote uh, and women began to uh, run for office themselves. Uh, they were running for a variety of public offices, school boards, county clerks, state legislatures, judgeships and eventually shortly before ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Congress. To make the point that women were interested in partisan politics and would be effective public officials, in the 19th century, two women ran for the presidency, for the post of the president. Victoria Woodhull in 1872 and Belva Lockwood in 1884 
and Belva Lockwood re-ran in 1888. It is rather ironic and also very interesting that both Victoria Woodhull and Belva Lockwood were allowed to contest for the presidency. They ran for the presidency to underline the legal anachronism, the absurdity of a situation where they were allowed to run for the presidency but were not allowed to vote for the presidency. So to, to highlight this absurdity, uh, they in fact uh, ran for office. Each of these two women repeatedly pointed out this irony. Lockwood ran a fuller, more national campaign than Woodhull, and she gave speeches across the country, organizing several electoral tickets. So this was not just a marginal kind of campaign. This was really, you know, a mainstream national um, affair. The change was to come in the early 20th century. And this came with the return to the United States of an extremely charismatic figure who was to change the course, if you like, of the suffragette movement uh, in that country. This is Alice Paul. Alice Paul studied in Britain at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Returning to the United States in 1913, she joined Lucy Burns and Olympia Brown to form what was known as the Congressional Union for the Women's Suffrage, or CUWS. This was renamed in 1917 as the National Women's Party, focusing on the right to vote on the same terms as men. In contrast to other organizations such as the National American Woman Suffrage Association, the NOSA, which focused on lobbying individual states, as I've just said, uh, from which the, the NWP uh, split, uh, the NWP put its priority on the passage of a constitutional amendment at the federal level. And they had a one-point agenda, which is women's suffrage, at the federal level. Well, my question is, the fact that Ellis Paul started in London, did it impact in any way on the American suffrage movement for women? Uh, yes, very much so. In fact, one of the stories about uh, the difference between the suffragette movement in the United States and, and Britain, now it's important to remember that in this period, which is mid-19th century to the First World War, in this period, the two countries which witnessed the strongest suffragette movements in the world were Britain and the United States. Uh, and the difference between Britain and the United States was that in Britain, you had a very militant uh, women's suffragette movement, uh, which derived a great deal of strength from its association with working class movements. Whereas in the United States, the women's suffrage movement was much more elitist and much more moderate, at least in its political strategies. Alice Paul, because of her um, association with the British suffragette movement, was able to bring very new strategies into the suffragette movement in the United States. The British suffragette movement actually happened on the streets as you may have come across in your other classes. There was a very strong association with working class organizations. There was a lot of um, direct confrontation of the police and other agencies of the state, uh, which is a kind of confrontation and combative uh, politics which the United States suffragette movement by and large avoided. Alice Paul f first brought those very militant methods into the United States. Uh, she organized huge demonstrations and a period when she undertook a daily picketing of the White House. Over the next couple of years, the police arrested nearly 500 women for picketing. 168 women were imprisoned for obstructing traffic. 
Alice Paul herself was sentenced to seven months in prison. She went on hunger strike several times. Uh, so she brought a new energy and a new edge to the suffragette movement. Now whether because of her tactics or whether it was the war uh, is not quite clear. By 1918, when the war was nearing its end, Woodrow Wilson succumbed to pressure, who was then the president. He argued that it was the war which in fact required that women be given the suffrage. He placed the matter before the House of Representatives several times in fact, um, and it did not uh, win the requisite majority until May 1919 when the House of Representatives passed an amendment allowing women to vote, uh, 304 in favor and 89 against. On 4th June 1919, the Senate finally gave in and passed it by 66 to 30. On 26th August 1920, the 19th Amendment was certified by the Secretary of State. Finally, when Tennessee, the 36th and final state that was needed, signed for ratification under the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. The 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Ratified on August 18, 1920, the 19th Amendment became the law of the land. Upon the victory, upon the, vic the, the winning of the right to vote, the NOSA, which was the National Association for Suffrage after all, had no purpose anymore, it was thought. So NOSA was disbanded as an organization. Instead, it was transformed into what was called the League of Women Voters. It was clear, and Alice Paul was, was very aware of this, that just winning the vote, vote was not enough. It would not secure women's rights uh, in other uh, fields even of public life. And she was the one person who consistently argued for women's rights on terms of equality. She had argued for women's suffrage on equal terms with men, if you remember, and she consistently argued that equality and not just the right to vote was the aim of the women's movement. And to this end, she suggested, proposed, uh, what she called an equal rights amendment, which would be much wider than merely uh, the question of the ability to vote. Now the ERA, which she first introduced to Congress in 1923, and this tells you something about the place of gender politics in the United States. Um, this uh, aimed at eliminating discrimination, all forms of discrimination on the basis of gender, was on the agenda of the United States Senate and House of Representatives Congress till the 1970s. It was passed finally in 1972, but has never actually been ratified.